there. Thanks for tuning in to one of our online sermons today. My name is Brianna Grunwald, and I'm the River Kids Director here at our Burton location at the River Church. And we'd love to connect with you today. One of the ways that you can connect is by texting River Connect one word, to 970-00, or by visiting our website at theriverchurch.cc to see more about who we are, what we do, and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church, you can do so by texting that dollar amount to 84321, or by clicking the Give tab on our website. We hope you're blessed and encouraged by the message today. So, last year at some point, my wife looked at me and she said, I want a fire pit in our backyard. And I said, okay, because that's the only right response in that situation. I said, okay, I'll figure out how to do it. Uh, and so I began the journey of trying to figure out where and how we would put a fire pit in our backyard. And it's not a very difficult task, right? Uh, I found some bricks that someone was giving away for free on Facebook Marketplace, went and picked them all up, uh, and we had decided on a spot that we wanted to make the fire pit. The problem was, in the spot that we wanted to build the fire pit was this massive, unruly bush. It was just like it had been growing for who knows how long, uh, and it had, you know, like some weird like rebar in it that was sticking out, and uh, it was just crazy. I, and I was like sitting there, I'm like, man, how do I get this thing out of here? Uh, you know, like I don't want to have to figure out hauling this out of here at thorns. It was just, it was just nasty. So what I, my great plan was, was I was going to take the bricks, right, and just kind of build around the bush and then uh you know like every classic man starting a fire get some gas get some wood right dump it on there and light it on fire we'll just burn that bush we'll have a little bit of Moses going on right and uh and so I got it all together right we started uh, to start the fire and, and we burned the bush down and there is no longer a bush in our backyard and I s- sat there and I was like man I saved myself so much time. I'm like, this is awesome, right? Like, I, I did this. Uh, I, you know, I met my wife's need, but I also didn't have to deal with hauling this bush out of here. And, and I, was, I was very happy, very proud, right? And this was a, around like a very similar time last year because I remember uh, we attended the Good Friday gathering at our Good, Goodrich location. Now, the people who owned the house previously to us, they go to the Goodrich location. And I actually worked with them for a little bit of time, which was really awesome because I could ask questions about the house, like, where is this? Or what the heck is this room? Or what's going on here? Right? But they came up to me and they said, we saw that you got rid of the grapevine in the backyard. Like, we, we cared so much about that, right? They were talking about how much they loved it and cared for it, you know, how great it was. And there was this immediate moment of guilt that like fell on me because I'm like, man, these people cared for this grapevine, right? Like they were like invested in it. It was supposed to be this beautiful thing. And like I burned it to the ground. Like, I'm a terrible person, right? And so I remember feeling like guilty and going to talk to Meg and she's like, that thing was a grapevine? And I remembered in my head, it immediately clicked. I'm like, hold on. Should I really feel guilty about this, right? I have lived here for over three years, and I have never once seen a grape on that thing, right? There has never once been a grape on that thing. So you can call it a grapevine all you want, but in my mind, still to this day, it is just an unruly bush. That's all it is, right? If it didn't produce grapes, it's not a grapevine. It's a bush, right? And and you can't convince me otherwise. And And Jesus actually says something similar to this, right? My, as much as you want to make fun of my line of thinking, we're going to look at a Bible verse this morning that is along that same line, right? Jesus talks about, in John chapter 15, where we'll be this morning, if you want to turn there, he talks about what it means to be a vine that bears fruit, to be Something that is healthy and bearing fruit, and something that is not, that is barren, that is dead. And he says one is worth something, and the other one should be burned. And it's really interesting 
because it proves me right. No, it's really interesting because it, it says a lot about who we should be as believers, as followers of Christ. So before we jump into that, let's take a second and pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, this morning as we dive in to what you tell us in Scripture, I pray that we would leave challenged. Lord, we would look at our own lives and we would not be defensive. We would not try and justify, but we would present ourselves to your word and let your word change us. That we would not try and change your word or make your word fit our lives, but that we would try and fit our lives around your word. In your precious name, Jesus' name, amen. So in John 15, starting in verse 1, we're going to look at what Jesus is teaching his disciples. Now we've been in this series leading up to Easter, leading up to the death and resurrection of Christ, and we've been looking at some of the things that Jesus decided to teach his disciples in his last moments, his last time on earth. And as I've said every week, we, we look at these things not because we just think it's fun to see what Jesus kind of was saying, but because we understand that what people teach in their last moments, what they know, because Jesus knew this was his last days on earth, so his last moments on earth, are some of the things that they understand or that they think are the most important, the most significant. And as Jesus teaches his disciples in his final moments, he teaches some very significant things, things that he thinks should define them as they continue on with the helper, the Holy Spirit, which we talked about last week. And Jesus, he starts to tell them a story about a vine. He compares them to vine. He says, I am the vine, which we're going to look at in a second. And then he talks about us as branches out of that. So if you would, look with me at John 15, 1 through verse 11. It says this, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it, it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing." If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. But this my Father is glorified. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so prove to be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commands, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept the Father's commands, commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. You see, it's interesting here. Jesus, he makes this distinction between people who are in him, and people that are abiding in him. He says these are two different things. There are people who want to identify with me, and then there are people who live their lives based on me. These are two different things. There are people who want to surround me. They want to kind of identify with me. They want to get out of hell free card. They want to just kind of sit around and identify and try and get whatever they can, get whatever benefits they can get out of following me. And then there are people that don't care about the benefits that see me and they just say, yes, I'm all in. Whatever you do, I do. I'm going to center my life around you. And that's why he uses this word, abide. Now, abiding, which is, I'm going to tell you the dictionary definition, there are two that I want us to kind of center around. The first one is to act in accordance with. It's a verb. It is living your life. It is doing things according to X. And what Jesus is saying is, if you want to be in me, if you want to be part of the vine and grow and produce fruit, 
You have to act in accordance with the things that I've said and the example that I've set. This has to be you. You have to live like this. That's what it means to abide in me. And then the second idea is to continue without fading or without becoming lost. It is an idea of continuing. That this idea is not just for a period of time, right? You don't just bear fruit for one season and then you're done. No, that season after season after season, you are fruit bearing. And this idea of abiding versus being around, it has to do with who you are at your core and how you choose to live. And for the disciples, when Jesus teaches this, this is not a very foreign concept. Turn with me back to John chapter 6, and we're going to be in verse 64. Now, in John chapter 6, Jesus does a ton of stuff. And you have probably heard, if you've been around church, some of the miracles that he works out in John chapter 6. He walks on water. That's a big one, right? He walks on water. He helps Peter walk on water before Peter's faith fails him and he falls into the water. Jesus feeds the 5,000 people, right? Jesus gets up. There are all these people. They don't have enough food. There's a boy who's got a bag lunch of some bread and some fish. Jesus splits it up, feeds all these people. We call it feeding of 5,000, but it was probably more like 10 to 15,000 because that was only counting men. Jesus feeds all these people, and there are multiple baskets of food left over. There's this massive miracle. And so all these people are gathering around, and there's all these people that are following Jesus, and there's even a a group of these guys who are like, yes, this is the Messiah. This is the teacher. This is the one that we're going to be all in, and we're going to follow. And so there are all these people that are gathered around who say, yes, I'm in with you, Christ. That's who I am. I want to be with you. But in John chapter 6 and the later half of the chapter, their tone switches. Jesus starts to talk about how he is the only way to get to the Father. He makes some controversial and difficult statements, which we talked about a little bit last week, right? Or we talked about it two weeks ago, that, that Jesus is the controversial guy. He loves to make true but difficult statements. And when the difficult start, statements start coming, people start rethinking how in they are. Well, this is what happens. John chapter 6, verses 64 through 68. But there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew that from the beginning, or Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Right? He says, I know that there are some people among you not looking at you, Judas, right? I know there's some people among you that you say that you're all in, you say that you want to follow me, but you don't. And there's one of you that's going to betray, betray me. Jesus knows this. Jesus understands this. The disciples at this point had it. They didn't understand this, and they definitely didn't know about Judas. But then this is what happens in verse 66. And after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? So we see that there's a distinction made here between disciples, people who followed after Jesus, and the 12 disciples, the people who stuck by Jesus, who said, I am all in, who said, I'm going to abide in you. And even in those 12, there was one who was still on the fence and ultimately betrayed Jesus. But we see here that their response was abiding in Jesus. Peter speaks up. He's usually the spokesman for the group. Verse 68 says this, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That is a clear statement. He says, you are the one. You got it. And I'm all in. I'm going to base my life. I'm going to base what I do. We are going to be followers of you. That's how we're going to be known. All those other guys, they can make their way back home. But I'm not. I ain't doing it. You see, their lives were changed. They were willing to stick it out, even through hard, difficult things that meant a change in their life. You see, there's a lot of people today who if you ask them if they're Christians, their response will be, oh yeah, I believe in God. 
I know there's a God. I know there's, there's a higher power. Or, or you talk about Jesus, and they're like, yeah, you know, Jesus, I believe in him. You know, I prayed a prayer once, or, you know, I, I got baptized this time, and, uh, you know, I'm good, right? I, I believe in Jesus. I'm all good. But here we see that Jesus is saying this is a thing about following. This is a staking your life on something. You have to look different, You will look different. It's not about what you do, but it's what I do through you. As you abide in me, I will do something different in you. There's a book that I really love. I shared with you a book that I really love last week, and I had to follow along with it this week. It's called Not a Fan. It's by a guy named Kyle Eidelman. And he talks about the difference between a fan and a follower. He says there's a fan, uh, he uses kind of the analogy of a football team or a sports team. He says there are fans of football teams, right? If you guys want to say that you're Lions fans, you know, power to you, that may not be a good thing. But, right, there are people who say, I'm a Lions fan. They know all the stats. They know everything about each player. They watch that, that series that walked through their off season. They may have season ticket hold, they may be a season ticket holder. And you know, that is a punishment to yourself. I don't know why, right? They, they know all the different things. They are all in. They are a huge fan of the Detroit Lions. Here's the thing. What they do does not matter to the players on the field. That's the reality right? They do not determine whether the Detroit Lions succeed or fail. They're not on the field. If the Detroit Lions lose, they may be broken up about it, but it doesn't affect their livelihood. It doesn't affect their life really that much at all. Versus someone who is a player, right? They, every day, whether it's game day or not, they are training, they are preparing, they are thinking about football. They live their life around winning games. When they're on the field, they're playing hard, they're fighting for every yard, they're doing what it takes to win. These are two different things. And what he says is there are a lot of people who think that they're in the game, they think they're followers of Jesus, when really they're just fans. They know a lot of stats about Jesus. They know the right uh, hot words to say. They may be able to pray real good in public, but they're not fighting for every yard. And he says this. He, he talks about there's a threat being to the church, a threat of these fans getting into our doors. He says this. The biggest threat to church today is fans who call themselves Christians but aren't actually interested in following Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything from them. Man, that is tough. And Jesus, he talks about what it looks like to abide in him. What it looks like to stay connected. He says in John chapter 15, the later part, starting in verse 9, he says there's an aspect of falling in love and being in love and being loved by God. Falling in love with God, being in love with, or being loved by God. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. That is what it looks like to abide in him. We have to begin to say, I am all in. I'm not just gonna hang around. I'm not just gonna, you know, like, learn what I need to learn in order to, you know, like, win the Christian trivia, which I don't know where you're doing Christian trivia, but maybe I'll join if you (laughs) invite me, right? But it's not about that. It's about abiding. It's about continuing. It's about walking. It's about staking your life around who Jesus is, what Jesus commands you, and following him. It's about not being the disciples that left when things got difficult, but when Jesus starts teaching true but hard things, saying, yes, I'll shift. I'll shift what I think. I'll shift how I live because that's what's true. That is how I need to live. 
And the thing is, Jesus, he, conti- he makes these statements, and, and they're difficult statements, right? He, he talks about some really hard things here, right? Things that we don't necessarily want to put on bumper stickers. Look at verse 2, John 15, verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And if you jump down to verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown in the fire, and burned. You see, what Jesus says here is, if you do not bear fruit, you are nothing more than an unruly bush, and you are no use to me. That is a difficult statement. That is a hard statement. But Jesus says it. It's true. He says, if you don't bear fruit, you're going to end up not with me. Right? This is not a comfortable statement. He's not talking about, you know, this cozy campfire. Right? You're going to be fuel for the cozy campfire. No, he's talking about hell. That's what he's talking about. He's saying, those of you who want all these benefits of being around Christ, who say that you're in me, but your lives don't look any different from the world around you, you are only fooling yourself. You are only mistaking the, that you think you're going to end up in heaven when in reality you're going to be cut off, gathered together, and put in the lake of fire. That's a harsh truth. And I read a passage like that, and my eyes pop out of my skull, right? I look, and I'm like, oh, man, I need to make sure that I'm bearing fruit. Right? There's this fear, this anxiety that wells up in our chest because the last place we want to end up is hell. Right? So we start to get nervous. We start to sweat. We start to fear that, oh no, if I don't do the right thing, if I don't say the right thing, if I don't make sure that I got at least one fruit in my life, you know, because once again, what we want is that get out of hell free card. But Jesus actually, he, he begins talking this way about the vine, about abiding in Christ, about bearing fruit, right after he talks about what we talked about last week, which is the helper, the Holy Spirit. And when he talks about fruit, Paul expands upon this idea in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, if you would turn with me there. And as Jesus talks about what it means to bear fruit, he says, you don't have to do this alone. This is a process by which we come together. And as you abide in me, I will grow those fruits in you. It's not your doing. You don't have to be concerned. It's not a works-based salvation. That's not what's going to happen. But the fruit is evidence. And what he's saying is, I'll grow it. Don't worry about growing it. But staying true, being true, to what I've called you to, will naturally produce these things. And the good thing is, I've given you a helper that will grow these things in you. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 25, Paul lays out the idea of what these fruits look like or what attitudes produce the fruit by which we're looking to grow. And he says this, but the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, which we talked about last week, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified by the flesh and its passions, to the flesh and its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step, or another great word here, abide. Let us keep in step, Following along, abide with the Spirit. You see, this fruit comes from the Spirit. He says, I'm going to send you this helper. This helper is going to be awesome. If you abide in me, if you look to follow me, if your life has truly been changed by the power of Holy Spirit showing you the depth of your sin and showing you that you need a Savior and that Savior is me and you follow me, these things will come up. You don't have to worry about getting thrown in the fire. Because you're not the one that's producing the fruit anyway. It's the Holy Spirit in you. It's the Holy Spirit producing these things. And as he produces this, these characteristics and these attitudes in your life, all that you do will produce fruit. All that you do will naturally honor and glorify God because who you are 
is defined as a branch tied into the Savior of the world. And so what we have to do is look and we have to analyze and say, if I'm not bearing any fruit, maybe I'm not connected the way that I thought I was. Maybe the Holy Spirit really hasn't shown me the depth of my sin. Maybe I haven't really seen the need for this Savior. Maybe my life isn't centered around Christ the way that I think it is. Because he talks about, jumping back to John 15, in verse 4, what that means, how this happens. The fruit that you produce is not according to you. It is not something that you can look and say, I got a lot of fruit on my branches. No, it's something that you look and say, man, God's doing something crazy in me. John 15, verse 4. Abide in me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. The only way you will produce fruit is if you center and stake your life around Jesus Christ. What he calls you to do, how he challenges you, how he calls you to look different. You see, there's a question that I ask myself and that I Whenever someone is wrestling on the fence with like what it means to truly devote themselves to Christ, or if they're struggling with, you know, like, am I really saved? What does that look like? I always ask them this question. And I would encourage you, if you're sitting here and you're like, man, I, I say that I follow Jesus, but I'm not seeing any of those fruits in my life. It's not my job to judge you. I don't know everything that's going on in your life. That's the Lord. But what you can do is you can analyze your heart. And it, it really comes down to this question. If I didn't know Jesus, would my life look any different than it does now? Is your life any different when you knew Christ versus when you don't? And don't just rush to answer yes, right? We immediately want to say, oh yeah, I got hope now. That's awesome. I'm glad you have hope. But what fruit are you bearing? Do your relationships look any different because you know Jesus? Do your friendships, do your marriage look any different because you know Jesus? Do the language you use, the jokes you tell, do they sound different because you know Jesus? Do you worry and fret about the same thing as the people in your life who don't know Jesus? Are you more patient? Are you kinder to other people in your life? Do you have more self-control now that you follow Jesus than before when you were doing whatever you wanted to do? That's tough stuff. That's hard questions. Because what Jesus says is, if you're abiding in me, if you're following me, if you believe in the gospel, if you say, I'm all in, my life's staked around that, one of those things will look different. Because the Holy Spirit's changing you, convicting you, and you are abiding in my love. You're holding to my commandments. Something's got to look different. Something's got to change. That hope that you say you have, that's awesome that you have it. What looks different because of it? Man. If you aren't seeing any, any of those things, if, if none of those questions are different, Maybe the question needs to become, am I saying I'm with Christ or am I abiding with Christ? Am I all in? But the last thing, he, Jesus emphasizes here the need for growth. Right? Some of you may be sitting in that room and say, I got some patience, good to go. Right? I don't need to worry about anything else. I'm good. Right? I, I got my one fruit and I'm going to ride it till I die. Right, that, that is my thing. I'm going to be the patient person, and I'm done. That is not what Jesus is saying here. He doesn't give an easy caveat when, when it comes to following him. He doesn't say, all right, you got one thing done, got one check in the box, and you're good. You won't be burned. He's saying, no, if you bear fruit, you're going to be pruned. That's what he says. Look with me back. John 15 Starting in the second half of verse 2. We're going through verse 4. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. 
that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. What he's saying is, if you abide in me and you're bearing fruit, naturally there's gonna be things that need to be cut off. That's what pruning is. It's cutting off dead spots, sores, different places that aren't ripe getting rid of those so that the energy, the nutrients can go to directly to the fruit and produce bigger and better fruit. That translates into our life. No person in here, whether you're bearing tons of fruit or you're bearing just one tiny little fruit, we are not without sin. And that sin needs to be pruned And we must endure difficult things and God will prune us to help grow and give us greater quantity of the fruits that we already display. You see, in James chapter one, James starts off his book as he talks about what this means. He gets into it. James chapter one, verse one, he says, hey, I'm James, here's what I'm writing to And here we go. And this is what he says. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. What he's saying is he's going to cut out sin and he's going to, allow you to endure hard things because those hard things will help you show more patience, show more self-control, be kinder to people that may be difficult in your life, to have greater joy even in the midst of difficult circumstances. I was watching a movie and they said something very profound. They said, when you pray and you ask God for joy, Do you think he just gives you joy? Does he give you circumstances or situations to show joy? When you pray and you ask for patience, does he just give you patience? Or does he give you situations or allow you to endure situations where you can demonstrate patience? That's the pruning in our lives. He's looking to get rid of the sin. He's looking to to cut those things out. And he's looking to help us to grow bigger, better fruit, grow fruit in more quality and quantity. You see, we're not exempt. No one is exempt. But abiding in Christ means continuing. Whether that means continuing and growing off fruit or growing more and more fruit through the grace and power of the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit in our lives every single day. And so, I'm a questions guy. I like to ask questions. I, I, my wife, you know, she, God bless her, right? She deals with a lot of my questions. But I like to ask questions because I like to understand how things apply to me. And I like to ask questions of myself to make sure that I've understood and make sure that what I've learned according to Scripture is shaping and changing my life. So I got two questions. I've been asking myself this, and I'd encourage you, ask yourself these questions. Because this is, this is kind of what Jesus is calling us to, in my opinion. It says this. Two questions. What fruit am I bearing? And what fruits do I need to bear? What fruits am I bearing in my life? And what fruits do I need to start bearing? Simple questions. Difficult to live out. And I encourage you, maybe take some time going out to lunch. Maybe Sunday's your nap day before you take your nap, before you turn on March Madness. Ask those questions. What fruit am I bearing? What fruits do I need to bear? Because we want to be people who abide in Christ, who continue with, who stake our lives around him. And that means producing fruit. That means being part of the vine and growing. 
shaping our attitude, shaping our character, and shaping the way that we live around his commandments, what he's called us to and the example that he's set because of what he's done. So I encourage you to reflect on the fruits that you're bearing and the fruits you need to bear. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, we look to you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you that your son died on the cross for us and that he rose again. And we're so thankful that we celebrate that every single day. Not just on Easter. But Lord, I pray that as we live in that reality, as we say we're all in, that we want to follow our Savior. Lord, I pray that we would be. We wouldn't just be people who identify, who are trying to to get certain things, but for people who say, wherever you lead, I'm in. Lord, because you loved me first, I am all in. I love you. And I'm going to stake my life. I'm going to stake everything I am, every way I live, everything that I do on your love. Change me. I don't want to look the same. Change me. Grow me. Because I'm all in. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your precious name, Jesus' name, amen.